Sin Insight Insight TV. I'm Executive Editor Michael Johnson. I'm joined today by my namesake, Michael Johnson, the uh, Executive Vice President of Parsons Corporation. Um, we wanted to bring you in because we have a lot of development going on, a lot of construction going on, um, and most notably, the $4 billion investment from the state and federal government and private corporations into LaGuardia and revising LaGuardia. Um, Parsons, just tell us a little bit about what Parsons does. First off, you guys do the development phase of a lot of these projects. We do, Michael. Actually, uh, Parsons is a worldwide company that provides engineering, construction, uh, public-private partnership advice, and we'll invest our own monies uh, into projects all throughout the world. And obviously with the LaGuardia project, you guys have some experience with aviation um, and building airports and building um, aviation-related uh, uh, developments to, to help get people in through trans transported through. Um, people look at LaGuardia and they see an old airport, a limited amount of space. So the first question I have is, like, how do you tackle that limited amount of space and making that you know, something you can grow into being more functionable? Sure. Well, I look at uh, LaGuardia itself, it's not unique. If you look at two other airports, look at Boston and Logan, and look at Reagan in DC. And those two airports are also built, if you will, in a postage stamp sized facility. And what it comes down to is just the throughput that you put at that airport itself. It has sufficient runway lengths. It's got the runways it's needed. Um, but the facility itself, being built in the 50s and rehabbed in the 70s, was built for 8 million passengers. Mm -hmm. And we're vastly approaching 14 million passengers. So the time is now to improve that efficiency. It's still a gem from a real estate standpoint. It's the gateway uh, to Manhattan for all three airports in the area. And, and to that point, you talk about the, the passenger load. I mean, are we in a point where there's, there's just too many passengers going through that? Is, is, is investing this amount of money to re, re, rebuild LaGuardia kind of worth it if you can't really expand it? I know, know like um, Sully Sullenberger has spoken publicly about how they should be investing that money in expanding the runways to make it more safe. Um, you know, obviously that's just one opinion, but is, is it worth it to invest into, into kind of redoing just the, um, uh, the terminals there to, to make them better for passengers when there's, you know, kind of hitting that maximum amount of people that can fly out of there. Right. So we've worked on 450 airports throughout the world. And the advantage that, La, that LaGuardia has right now is it's improving its efficiency. So right now they have what I'll call low speed okay. with regards to gas. You, know, you gas your airport, your airline, uh, you get your aircraft moving. Sometimes they have to be dragged away from the gate and put across to the side. You high speed the gas itself. You start to improve your efficiencies in and around the airside facilities. It's about throughput. It's about changing those gates over um, from aircraft to aircraft. That's really the advantage that that airport has right now is obviously the proximity to Manhattan, yeah. but making it a much more uh, efficient facility. So even with the proximity to Manhattan, we have a lot of people complaining that there's not enough mass transportation to get there, not enough transportation options to get there. I know the ferry is one option that they're considering with this development. Is that, does it have, that have to be part of this kind of redevelopment as well? Is, can you, is it really worth it to spend $4 billion on a terminal if you can't get people there more efficiently? Well, let's see, that airport's grown at 4% per year since mm -hmm. 2003. Uh, moving people efficiently in and around the area, taking off some of the congestion on the parkway itself would obviously be very important. I think providing better transit options, not only to the airport, um, but the citizens of Queens mm -hmm. would be very important uh, in addition to the airport onto itself. Yeah, and I, as a resident of Queens, I can second that as <laughs> someone who drives the 7 train very often. Um, another big project we're talking about uh, in New York City has been the Hudson River Tunnel, and obviously there's been a big fight recently with, you know, Governor Christie running for president, people bringing up the fact that he killed the project, you know, back in eight years ago now, I think it was. Um, you know, the Governor Cuomo talking about, you know, how he wants it, but he doesn't want the state to bolster the full uh, uh, cost of that. Um, can you put into perspective for people kind of why, how important the tunnel is and, and you know, I guess how the best, the best approach to deal with this stuff? I know Parsons has done a lot of tunnel projects. We have. We were originally the program manager for the uh, art project. Yeah. So that was a big, uh, a big blow. You had to pick mm -hmm. yourself off the canvas when a project of that size and magnitude yeah. uh, is taken back. But, you know, Governor Christie had a very good point. I mean, he did not want to uh, take the burden, potentially any cost overruns, and put that on the citizens and the future citizens of New Jersey uh, to carry that burden. And he shouldn't carry that alone. And I, I think it's really part of a bigger picture. There is going to be a, a challenge and there's going to be controversy. It's, a, it's a, somewhere in the range of a $16 billion project 
if you compare that to east side access, that's a $10 million tunnel alone. Mm -hmm. And looking at what needs to be done, there needs to be support. And this should be on the national platform. Anyone who's running for president, infrastructure needs to be number one on that platform. And, and to that point, I mean, I think that, that, that something that gets lost is the tunnel, you know, doesn't just impact New Jersey and New York. This is a tunnel that's utilized for the whole Northeast Corridor. So this is something that, you know, would, would benefit, you know, Boston and Massachusetts, for example, same as D.C. as well, right? Right. Absolutely. Uh, if, if you look at the way that's utilized, I'm sure all of us have been stuck at one time or another uh, under the river waiting to get access into Penn Station. I know I have on many occasions. There's also redundancy. If something happens to one tunnel, what's the access to Manhattan's core without that one tunnel? Um, we're kind of hamstrung at that scenario right now. We really do need a second tunnel. Definitely. Um, you talked about the cost briefly. You mentioned $16 billion. Some people have said $20 billion. It seems like all of these projects, you know, they have a target cost, and then the overruns can tend to go you know, into the billions of dollars or you know, go 25% above what the original cost is. Why does this continually happen? And you can maybe talk to people a little bit about the process about like, what the cost estimate is based on and, and how they can you know, be vastly off. Because I think the average person, they hear it, and they're like, why does this keep happening? Why does this keep going over? Is there some kind of level of corruption that's involved? Because that's the first thing they're going to think about. Sure. Well, it's a very challenging environment to work in, number one. If you look at the uh, New York, New Jersey marketplace, uh, it's challenging because of the amount of people that you're moving, the services, the goods, that are all happening. This city can't stop, mm -hmm. ever. Um, with regards to cost overruns, there are certainly projects that we can point to where you don't have cost overruns. There's fixed price elements. Uh, take a look at Gothel's Bridge as a good example, another public-private partnership um, with a fixed cap on it. But I, I'd say that there are other major infrastructure projects. I mean, these big projects that move the needle from a national perspective, uh, those are the ones that, that really drive economies, especially here in this area. And when you look at something like the, the Hudson River Tunnel, I mean, even if it went to $20 billion, would you, wouldn't you argue or do you think that there is an argument to say that there would still be worth it even at the higher price level? And, and is it, would it be beneficial for maybe politicians and other people to make the case that like, it might cost as much as this, but it's still worth it, as opposed to saying like, we can do it for this much, but there might be overruns later and then dealing with that consequence? I think the key is to get your ducks in a row right away. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is, um, don't do what I'll call a traditional estimate. Don't look at the past to predict the future. Gotcha. Do a construction-oriented estimate. Have companies that come in that work day-to-day -day, uh, with our unions, uh, have worked exclusively in New York, that understand exactly how projects get done here. Give yourself a legitimate estimate right up front versus just a wag. And um, along the same talk of you know the Hudson River Tunnel, we also have the Oculus Structure World uh, Trade Center that just has started to open up. Uh, parts of it have just started to open up. This is something that Parsons was involved in. Are you guys happy with how this project played out? Or was there anything that you know maybe you would have done over or done differently uh, in retrospect? Well, the Oculus is one of those projects that's so iconic. It's a place that you know I'll bring my grandchildren, and hopefully they'll bring their grandchildren as well. Uh, I'm sure you've spent time mm -hmm. in and around the area. Um, I'm very happy. The vision that Santiago Calatrava and his architects came up with, our job was to make sure that vision was constructible. And of course, there's been changes, but the vision and the intent of the project hasn't changed at all. Great. Um, as a resident of New York, I also want to talk to you about a couple other quick things. Um, one of it being our, a, pr a former resident of upstate New York, and now live in Queens, as I mentioned. Um, I want to talk to you about the I-81 project in Syracuse, which um, if anyone who's ever been there knows the, the highway just cuts the city right in half. It's a, it creates a basically a pedestrian wasteland where you can't walk from one side of the city to the other side. This is not a concept that's, you know, uh, rare. It's something that we've seen in a lot of upstate cities. Tell us a little bit why we see this in upstate cities first before we talk about the project itself. Sure. Well, it goes back to our highway system itself. When we laid out the grid program. You look at whether it's Syracuse or Buffalo or even Rochester, uh, the major thoroughfares ran right through the hearts of the cities, um, disconnecting communities themselves. And obviously there's been a lot of passion um, by communities all over the country to reconnect communities and reconnect places. And so with the Syracuse project specifically, there's a bunch of, a bunch of ideas being thrown out there right now. Um, the most expensive one was to build a tunnel. Right. That kind of got shot down a little bit. But tell us where the tunnel situation stands right now, if that's still a, a, a possibility going forward. Sure. We're working in collaboration with the New York State DOT on developing their environmental process. So they're in a scoping program right now 
where all alternatives are being considered. Uh, everything from a null alternative or a do nothing uh, through what I'll call a community grid program to another viaduct and of course studying the tunnel as well. So it's really that public engagement uh, part as well as working with the stakeholders. I know the mayor has been very vocal and mm -hmm. in, um, in what the city needs to reconnect University Hill back to a growing downtown core. Definitely. Um, would your sense be that, you know, this is a situation where obviously you talk about pu public-private partnerships, you're going to need, need to have some level of state funding probably as well. You said talked about working with the DOT to make this happen. Um, do you think that the tunnel is a situation where that might be just be too cost prohibi pro prohibitive going forward and that the alternative seems like more likely? Or is this a situation where you kind of, as, as someone in your position where you might be developing this, you just kind of provide the options and, and you let the political process play out? I mean, clearly, Obviously, if there's a tunnel built, that's more money invested, probably more money for you guys. But it seems to me like you you put all these options forward, so there's you're you're, you're not as involved with pushing one project over the other. Sure. Well, obviously, on the um, uh, this phase of the study that Syracuse is providing, um, the cost component is not a driving factor. It's what's in the best interest of the community itself, and what's going to have the longest lasting ability to mer to move services and goods throughout the area. And then cost comes in really into factor um, towards the end of the alternatives analysis phase. Great. Well, we'll be watching that project very closely, um, all these projects very closely as we go forward. Um, thanks for joining us. Michael Johnson, Executive Vice President, Parsons Corporation. Thanks, Michael Johnson.